Let's get a microphone. And try that all over again. Let's finish up the United Monarchy with episode four, where we're going to talk about Solomon. Background might look a little different today. Just kind of gussied it up a little bit because Solomon's coming over and he is the king of luxury glitz and glamour, at least for this period of time we're talking about. So let's go back to where we started. We started the class by talking about the 12th century BCE, the collapse of the late Bronze Age. And we talked about the fall of the Hittites to the north and the Egyptians to the south. The Egyptians didn't fall, but they became a kingdom instead of this, you know, vast empire, in part because of a 150-year drought and perhaps related to that because of the incursions of the unknown sea peoples who came and uh, tended to have better tactics and more people and really drove some of these empires back into place. Of course, the Canaanites weren't worrying about that at all, and neither were the Israelites because they didn't have a centralized government. They weren't a big world player. They weren't taking part in all this global trade business. They were just pretty tribal and agrarian at the time of the collapse of the late Bronze Age. Everything changes, though, by the time we get through with Solomon. But I wanted to remind you that that's where we started in this class, was talking about the Canaanite and Israelite people together on the land of the Levant without being really a major world player. The sources that we use when we talk about Solomon are the same sources we've used throughout the class. We're talking about finding the stories of David and Solomon in the books of Samuel, the books of Kings, and the books of Chronicles. And part of the Solomon stories, vast majority, are from the Deuteronomistic historian who we've called DTRH. Some people call him DTR for short. We don't know if it's a him or a they or a she or... It's one of the theorized biblical writers. And it's the a similar theology throughout the idea of blessings and curses. Blessed are the people if they do this, cursed are they if they do this. It's not from our modern concept of history as a recording of the facts. It's a playbook for the future by reminding us what happened when people of the past did certain things. So it's very much meant to instruct the future. So we meet Solomon after the vast decline of David. And there are a few things that sort of mark Solomon's rise to power as the next king following David. I want to remind you that this is the first time that a son has succeeded his father as king because, of course, Saul was David's father-in-law. They call each other father and son perhaps, to legitimize that succession. But this is the first time one of, you know, David's sons is going to become the king. We're a monarchy now. We need a proper king. And now we're going to take the king's son. It's not the firstborn son. It's the son that the king chooses. And so there's going to be some mayhem. Mayhem, of course, because we have sons competing for a kingship. Now, Adonijah wants to be the king, and the people seem to be, he yeah, seems to have some people and some power behind him on that. He even goes after Abishag, the young virgin who was sleeping in David's bed. I always say she was sleeping with him, but she wasn't sleeping with him, um, which is scripture is very clear to tell us. And so he's trying to sort of legitimize himself as the successor, but something happens. Bathsheba and Nathan come together. Now, Nathan is sort of like mm, the prophet that serves alongside David after Samuel is gone. And so Nathan is the one who points out to him that he was sinful in sleeping with Bathsheba. And now it is Nathan who works with Bathsheba to make sure that Solomon makes it onto the throne. And so there's some little playing of games early in the story, but eventually Solomon is chosen as the successor. 
Solomon, one of Solomon's first acts then is to kind of clean up some of the stuff that might have appeared like corruption or might have actually been corruption. I have mentioned in the class there were some uh, that sometimes we think of these stories, particularly in uh, DTRH, as sort of royal propaganda that shores up David's kingdom and his importance and his goodness. And one of the accusations that seemed to come up were that people died around David, people that uh, David did not need to fight with. They just died and somebody killed him, but it wasn't David. And so the scriptures are always telling us like, but it wasn't David. It was this guy, Joab. Joab seems to have been kind of like David's enforcer. He was, I'm not going to go so far as to say hitman, but he's the guy that got his hands dirty for David. And so one of the first things Solomon does is he dumps Joab. And so he kind of cleans up the kingdom. Cleaning up the kingdom is what Solomon is going to be really good at. David grew the kingdom. I mean, he really took them from this agrarian culture to having a centralized government, and he he made them into a single nation, and he was this great leader that they loved, and he went out and he fought military battles, and he and political battles, and he grew his kingdom. Solomon is not that guy. Solomon is not a great warrior. Solomon is not everybody's favorite guy. Solomon is going to grow the kingdom in different ways. And one of the ways he's going to do that is by cleaning things up and honestly just being a pretty good bureaucrat. Solomon is, of course, known for his wisdom. In fact, the entire wisdom tradition of uh, the Jewish scriptures or the Hebrew Bible is often connected to Solomon. Some of those books, of course, came after Solomon, but you have books like the Song of Solomon that is a Song of Songs, I typically call it, but it is often called Song of Solomon, and it is attributed to Solomon because Solomon is connected to the wisdom tradition because what did Solomon ask God for? He didn't ask God to kill his enemies. He asked God to give him wisdom. And so a point is made about Solomon being very, very wise. And so it became part of the layers of wisdom tradition in the Hebrew scriptures. And um, so sometimes you'll hear a lot of things being attributed to Solomon. What we know is he was known for being wise. The most famous story is the splitting the baby story. And I am sorry to tell you that is not the first time that has ever appeared in literature or the first place that it's ever appeared. That was a fairly common wisdom. Like our ruler is wise. Look how wise he is. He knew that if you had two women that said a baby was theirs and you offered to split it in half, the real mother would come forward and say, no, save the baby. So it's, it's, it's a little bit kitschy, maybe, that story. Then we see that Solomon starts establishing foreign relations. Hallelujah, they're not an agrarian culture anymore with no centralized government. They have a centralized government. They're going to start trading. They're going to start exporting resources and importing resources. And they're, you know, they're going to get in all kinds of trouble with that. But they're going to start having relationships with foreign countries because they are actually a solid nation state under Solomon. Solomon does massive, brilliant acts of administration. And I think one of the things that really struck me it is that Solomon knew when he split up into districts that he could manage and that he could, you know, appoint a manager to this geographic district and this geographic district, Solomon did something pretty clever. He did not use the traditional lines that had been used by the 12 tribes before. You know, they'd been tribal. We've talked about that tribal, agrarian. He did not split his administrative districts into the same districts they would naturally go to because those were their relatives, or at least their closer relatives because they were pretty much lots and lots of relatives around. But he split them into new sections so they would be forced to, you know, go pay their taxes with people they weren't first or second cousins with. What this did from the Israelite and Judean perspective would be, you know, he split us up and we aren't just with our tribe anymore. From a centralized government perspective, 
he basically gerrymandered so that, you know, that term from, from politics, he redrew dr- district lines to give him regions that weren't all related. And so what happened was you you had something else to sort of be associated with, and it weakened those tribal connections and made them into more of a nation and less of a group of organized tribes. That's pretty smart if you're trying to get a tribal group into a national model. So Solomon was known for being a really good administrator. That, you know, I'm... That, but it's not the most exciting thing to be, right? I mean, Solomon was pretty good for with a budget. Solomon liked to bring in money. Solomon liked to entertain foreign dignitaries and set up vassal relationships with other countries. Solomon was really good at stuff that a central government needs, but he wasn't the world's most inspiring leader. And that shows, actually, in Scripture because— while David's stories were so personal that it's it's shocking, it was shocking to me to realize how much sort of real life story there is about David. You don't get a lot of that of Solomon. It's sort of like the narrator of the story takes a couple of steps back because there's not really that much to talk about, except he seems to be very good at Excel. The other thing Solomon was very good at was amassing riches. And once he made himself personally wealthy and the kind of king like other countries around them had, he turned to massive building projects. And we know what one of those building projects was, the first temple, which was built during Solomon's reign after, of course, he built a palace. So the palace in Jerusalem and the temple were built under Solomon. They were massive building projects. How did he build them? Ugh, conscripted labor. It's been really interesting for me this time researching and teaching David. I don't think it had struck me before how much I feel like I've heard these stories. Of course, I've heard these stories because I've read the Bible and I've studied and I've taught this class before, but it's different a different way. I studied in college Chinese history because I was preparing to go to China. And I learned that Chinese history is considered cyclical. And I studied a lot of the decisions the different emperors and regimes made. Mm, There is so much in common between ancient China and ancient Israel in this sort of progression that they're making. One of the things is this use of conscripted labor. How did the Great Wall get built? Conscripted labor. I mean, you just force your people to come do it for a couple of years. That's what Solomon started doing in Israel was he just would go into a place and they, I mean, not him. I'm sure one of the people who administrated that he administrated, one of his managers would go in and they would just get people to come work and you had to go build whatever he told you to build. And so, yeah, he got some amazing things built, but the people didn't really choose to be a part of it. And that gives us an idea that things, it might just not be about Solomon not being, you know, easy to market as a charming guy, but it might actually have turned toward this isn't really the king we wanted he he goes from maybe not popular to unpopular because of conscripted labor and because of the way he gathers wealth and wives for himself and horses when we started this class on the united monarchy i talked about samuel's disinterest in setting up a kingdom for the israelites because They were, after all, supposed to be led by God as their king. And so there was some back and forth about whether they should have a king. So I want to take you back to some of the words Samuel said in 1 Samuel 8 and read them to you so you can think about mm, whether they knew what they were getting, I guess we might say. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground 
and to reap his har- harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. It came to pass very quickly in the son of King David, King Solomon. Now let's talk about sort of an interesting rabbit hole you might go down. I talked about this rabbit hole in the live class and found out that there were people, at least one person who had already gone down the rabbit hole. And that is the rabbit hole of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, or maybe the Queen of Saba. Um, The Queen of Sheba came to look at Solomon and his kingdom and all of his administrative wisdom, and she was satisfied and she went back home. That's what we know from scripture. In Ethiopia, there is a very very deep well of understanding about that that is not contained in the Hebrew Bible. That's how I'm going to say that. So in Ethiopia, there are people, and I mean, there are people, other people in the world who believe this too, um, that believe that the Queen of Sheba went home from Solomon's house pregnant and that she gave birth to the son of Solomon, who he preferred, and maybe even that he gave the ark to, you know, the the lost ark, the Raiders of the Lost Ark ark, Uh, that that ark. I don't mean to call that because, of course, it's the ark of the Bible, but most people, like millennials and older, know it from Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, the ark disappears, tribes disappear, Ethiopia, some people in Ethiopia are like, yeah, no, we know where that stuff is. And it all connects back to the story of the Queen of Sheba visiting Solomon. So if you want to go down a rabbit hole, oh my goodness, you'll spend months in that rabbit hole learning about Solomon and the king of the Queen of Sheba. So what brings Solomon down, right? Because what goes up must come down and Solomon's going to have, he had a rise. It was very quick and now he's going to have a demise and that is going to be about his appetites. So his wives, um, I think he had hundreds of wives and hundreds of concubines. Okay. And he, some of those wives ended up being foreign women. So some of his wives he gained because he wanted to solidify a relationship with another country. And maybe it was the the princess of that country. But he also just, you know, he was in an area, a lot of Canaanites, a lot of, you know, how many different kinds of people are in that area that are named in the Bible. And so, you know, Moabites, Ammonites, all those different folks, he married them. He let them set up their sacred spaces and conduct their rituals that were sacred to them in the kingdom. And of course, Israel is going to have a problem with that. I'm sure the Canaanites wouldn't, right? I've told you in this class that it it sort of feels like in this part of the Bible that every time you turn around, somebody's pulling out a household god or some kind of statue. So it feels a little weird that there's so much con- condemnation in this part of the scripture about Solomon and his wives and their religious practice. And But this is DTRH, remember. This is Um, blessings and curses and getting and instructing future generations about what good and bad happened in the past. And so DTRH is letting us know this way leads to madness. You can't have, you can't have all these foreign gods and all these foreign wives being worshiped and your king doing that. If you're the king of Israel, no, 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 no. So it's quite a big deal. The other thing is Solomon had a thing for horses. He really liked to have horses, of course, horses, chariots, you know, horses, army. So he went back to Egypt or sent people back to Egypt to get his horses. And that was specifically prohibited 
in scripture. So this is Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 17. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it. And you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations surround us. Um, hello, this is Deuteronomy I'm predicting this, right? Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Hmm. So the Solomon we meet at the end period of the United Monarchy, he's exactly what the Deuteronomistic historian is warning people about in the book of Deuteronomy, which is another book in what we think is one long story. So Deuteronomistic historian, not a big fan of Solomon. So you might wonder, uh, because, I mean, you may not wonder because some people don't care about who wrote it, but I wonder about that. So if David is the centerpiece and then Solomon like sort of instantly isn't the good guy, what's the point of DTRH writing about him? And, you know, God says that God's going to keep the promise to Solomon, even though Solomon is not doing what God wants with the foreign wives and the going back to Egypt for horses and all that stuff. And it's not even the foreign wives, right? It's their worship of their foreign gods and not of the one God. So why is DTRH so hard on Solomon when that's David's son? And God's not as hard as Solomon because God says that's David's son and he wants the house of David. He wants David's line. So David is the centerpiece of the Deuteronomistic historian. Like it's in this big story in the center and there's more material in there about David. It's very pro-David. David's the king that all other kings will be measured against. But the point of the Deuteronomistic historian is not to instruct people of Solomon's generation or the next generation or the next generation. It's really all about instructing people around the time of King Josiah. So I'm thinking probably next year I will do a class on Josiah's reforms because it does help explain the Deuteronomistic historian and their point and the work. It And a lot of people don't remember what the deal was with King Josiah and the scroll that was found that renovated the Israelite government. But we'll talk about that in the next class. For now, maybe it will just help to know that it's, it's for somebody. It's not just propaganda randomly written because we're Team David hundreds of years later. There's a purpose, and it's a holy purpose for the restructuring of Judean government in the future. Because DTRH is not about the past. It's about the future. Remember? Been saying that for weeks. After Solomon is gone, around 930, 931, there are two kings that come to be uh, Rehoboam in the south and Jeroboam in the north. Rehoboam, son of Solomon, God punishes Solomon by taking the whole kingdom away from him after he's gone. Not while he's alive, but after he's gone, he gives only the bottom, the bottom. I mean, the most southern point, the, the southern part of the Levant to his son. And so that's when you have the end of the United Monarchy because you have Rehoboam staying in the south and then Jeroboam comes up and leads in the north. And they are now two separate nations, which if you think about it is pretty massive because less than 200 years ago, there weren't even one nation. So we leave the Israelites in the 10th century BCE very, very different than we found them in the 12th century BCE. They have stabilized. They have um, 
split and now they're going to have two separate governments and a lot of the rest of the Hebrew scriptures is going to be a push and pull between North and the South and different versions of the stories. Sometimes they say in Bible study, you know, there's a Northern version and there's a Southern version. And so when the accounts got put together, they they get layered and you have the North and the South and the North and the South. This is the moment when that really becomes important. And I think we can understand why there would be a Northern account and a Southern account. The Southern account is going to be much more tied to the descendants of Solomon, to Jerusalem, to the temple, because it's in Jerusalem. And the North is going to be more, you know, we're different. We're not about the power structures in the South. It's going to be poorer. It's going to be more of the tribes. So it's going to be more diverse. It's going to be really interesting from here on out. This moment changes things. I also want to close this class with a question I asked in person, and it really solicited a lot of commentary. I want you to think about if you could pick a leader that you would want to live under the rule of, which king would you pick? Would you pick Saul? Would you pick David? Or would you pick Solomon? That could give you a lot of thinking and reading to do. I will tell you that I picked the unpopular option that I would rather serve under Saul because Saul and his government had not developed enough to mess up the life of the everyday people. But for now, we'll say goodbye to the 10th century Israelites. And I'm so grateful that I got the opportunity to teach this and that you watched it along with others. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and use that email address that we post in at the end of every one of our Bible studies. And you can reach out and get an answer from me. I'd be glad to answer your questions and maybe incorporate them in future stuff that we do. I'm always looking for something new to teach, especially interesting ideas. So next year, I know that two of the things on my list to teach are apocalyptic literature and the reforms of Josiah, which will probably be a fairly short one. And then I'm going to redo Genesis so that I can teach that basic Hebrew Bible again. Anyway, thanks for being a part of the United Monarchy.